It's very nice to see everyone this morning. I hope that you're having a great conference. Um, I'm excited to be here. Uh, my name is Pamela Emery. Um, I, I am working with the Office for Safe Schools. I am a consultant with them. I've been with PD about 10 years as a consultant. So um, it's just fun to be here. I have some interesting information for you. You've probably already heard about it. And I would like to introduce my partner in crime, Jean Kelleher. Hi, I'm Jean Kelleher, and I've been with the Department of Education for 12 years, going on my 13th year already. Started as the Family and Consumer Science Program Specialist, and now I am in the position of Manager for Program Standards and Quality Assurance. Pam and I have been working together for several years on the Career Ready Skills Continuum and all the other um, things that are available that we'll be sharing with you. So um, we're ready to get this thing started. Yeah. There Let's, get go. Started. Let's get this party started. Okay, so today, this is what we're going to do. We're going to talk about, we're going to talk about the career ready skills. This lady needs a chair. You need a chair. Hmm. <laughs> um, and we're going to look at uh, social emotional learning through the career ready skills because basically that's what they are. Uh, these skills are social emotional learning skills that are linked to employability skills, directly linked. They are essential skills. Go ahead. We'll just keep doing this. Um, we're going to take a look at the continuum of skills. So this is a framework that frames all of the skills. <laughs> We're also going to, Vanna, we have a Vanna. This is so good. Uh, discuss the elements that you need to think about when you're thinking about creating career ready skills in your school community. Okay, we're gonna try another one? Okay. I don't know what happened to mine. <laughs> And as we discuss the career ready continuum, everybody in your registration packet, you have a copy of it. It uh, looks like. And if you do have one in your registration packet, which you you should, could you take it out? So as we refer to it, it would be helpful for you to ta actually look at it and put eyes on it. Okay. Okay. That one right there. Yep. Make sure it goes back to it. <laughs> I will. Thank you, sir. <laughs> okay, so we're going to share some ideas about uh, what your school might look like with the career ready skills. We're going to look at some of the tools and we'll have some time for questions. So um, I would like you to take a minute to answer three questions with a colleague. The first one, what characteristics do you think of when you think of workforce readiness? What characteristics do uh, students need to have? How do, you, how do you prepare your students for work? And are you confident that your students possess employability skills that employers seek? So I'm going to just give you about a minute to a minute and a half talk and turn. No, they got them. Yeah, yeah, that'd be great. Yeah. Good morning, if you're coming in. We're doing a talk and turn, and these are the three things that we're talking about that are up. Okay? Thank you. 
right, I'm going to bring you back. Three, two, one. Thank you. All right. The first thing I asked you to talk about were characteristics of what you think about when you think of workforce readiness. Could someone share? Attendance. Good attendance. Okay. Respect for authority. Respect for authority. Good. Empathy. Empathy. Communication. Communication. Yeah. Attitude. Attitude. Cleanliness. Cleanliness. Effort. Manners. Manners. Absolutely. Anything else? Come on. Persistence. Persistence. I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't hear that one. Communication. Com it's, up there. it's up there. Focus. Good. Focus. 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 Okay. One more? Problem solving. Problem solving. Perfect. Okay. Thank you. Question two. How do you prepare your students for work right now? What are you doing? Training. Training. Can you just? We'll train them how to, to be there, to do what they're going to be doing. OK, so work, workforce experience training? OK. I can't hear. Sir? Uh, holding their behaviors to standards an employer would. Okay, so um, behavior, expected employer behaviors, right? Yes. Yes. Job shadowing. Job shadowing. Good. Model what you want. Model what you want. Any more? What are you doing right now? Mock interviews. Good. Time cards, perfect. Work study programs. Work study programs, perfect. This is good. Okay. Conflict resolution lessons. Conflict resolutions lessons. Yes. Thank you. All right, we're going to move on. Are you confident that your students possess employability skills that employers seek? Yes or no? Show hands. Uh, if, if your hand is closed, that's a yes. If it's open, that's a no. Show hands. You're confident. Your kids. OK. Well, we have that mixed. All right. Well, thank you. That's pretty mixed. <laughs> All right. I think a lot of times, too, what goes into what we were talking about here is maturing. And like that really just happens over time. Like we can we can instill in them a lot of the values and we can model and they see that and they'll take it. But I think a lot of times it's it's maturity level and it just takes time. I think maturity definitely factors in. Um, but I believe that um, in order to get to that maturity level, we've gotta we've gotta give kids the skills, right? So that when they are mature and their thought processes mature, they understand those skills and are able to um, practice them. Thank you. Okay, so social emotional learning, this is the definition. It's a process. It's an essential skill. It is not an add-on. If you've ever worked with someone who doesn't have social emotional skills, who doesn't play nice in the, play, in, the, in the sand, it's miserable. It's not nice. Um, so these skills allow children and adults to effectively apply attitudes and skills to understand and manage emotions, set and achieve goals, feel and show empathy for others, establish and maintain positive relationships and be able to make responsible decisions. In Pennsylvania, these skills are called career-ready skills. 
they have lots of different names. They are called soft skills, 21st century skills, employability skills, and I just read an article that calls them power skills. Okay. <laughs> They're very, very essential. The, the title from yesterday's keynote speaker, what she called them. Drive. Driving skills. Driving skills. You have a better memory than me. I knew there was one, though. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay, in Pennsylvania, we have three, and um, if you have your, if, if everyone did not receive one of the continuums, let me know. It should be in your packet. It's very pretty. <coughs> Could you take it out, please, if you don't already have it out? Jean, I think you should talk for a little It should be right in your packet. Let us know if you don't have one. Okay. They have one. Okay. So. There are three categories of skills. They are self-awareness and self-management. And when you think about self-awareness and self-management, these are the skills or the behaviors that should be happening for self-awareness and self-management. So our kids should be able to identify their emotions. When you think about your maybe preschooler. Are they able to tell you how they're feeling? I don't know. Self-perception and identity. I'm a me. Recognizing their strengths and their needs. Having self-confidence. That's hard. Impulse control. Stress management. Still working on that one. We are all works in progress, by the way. Self-discipline. Self-motivation, perseverance, goal setting, organizational skills, and self-efficacy. That's the first big bucket. The second one, this can try, I got to put this one over here. Second one is establishing and maintaining relationships. This is really important. They're all important. Perspective taking and empathy, appreciating diversity, and respect for others. And then social problem solving. There's your communication, the ability to socially engage, to build relationships and work cooperatively, the ability to solve problems, and to analyze situations prior to acting. And pretty important. So we know that right now, these skills are demand everywhere. In the public, the expectation for schools is now to be able to teach cooperation, respect, and problem solving. Your district personnel, your, um, your um, office people, central office people, say that SEL skills are important. They should be taught to all students. Your principals in schools, I'm married to one. Um, committed to developing students' social and emotional skills. Teachers are telling us that a greater focus should be on social emotional learning because they see the outcomes when that's not happening. Parents, three out of five parents, this is interesting, whenever they were asked, gave greater importance to kids being happy and not overly stressed than to doing well in school. It's interesting. These are all research-based, by the way. Students, high school students told us that they would much prefer to be in a high school where social-emotional learning skills were practiced. Why? There were less um, cases of bullying, of outing people, of conflict, more cases of um, just everyone getting, getting along for the most part and being accepted in their schools. Okay. And then finally, our employers. 
We know that most of the jobs that are available today, all of the jobs, they require social emotional skills. And that the mastery of those skills has uh, outpaced growth of all other jobs in the job community. Okay, so I'm making a case. When these skills are integrated into lessons, we're not talking about taking a separate period where you work with kids in social emotional learning skills. We're talking about integrating the skills into what you're already doing. No one needs one more thing to do, okay? Here's some of the outcomes. When these skills are integrated, and kids have an opportunity to practice them, teachers model them, and kids have an opportunity then to reflect a little bit on what they're doing, you're gonna see an increase in attendance, in positive social behaviors, in engagement, and achievement. And the achievement, there, was a, there were two studies that were done. One was done in 2017, one was done in 2011. The one in 2011 showed a sustained increase in student achievement by 11 points, 11 percentage points. The one in 2017 showed um, an, a gain of 13 percentage points, not for a year, but sustained over time. That's pretty impressive. Remember all the time whenever uh, PSSAs came out and we lost our arts, we lost social studies, sometimes we lost health, you name it. Um, and we did a lot of math and we did a lot of reading, right? So we did a lot of skill and drill. What happened? What happened? You might have had a slight increase for a year, but it, you know, what happened, there were a couple of things. Kids started to really not like math and reading. Mm -hmm. And that increase, if there was one, was not sustained. Okay, and then when these skills are taught on a regular and sustained basis, you'll see a decrease in these things. Mental health referrals. Mental health is such a, a big deal for our students. Okay. And in the employment community, students who graduate that possess these skills, they're desired by prospective employers. Why not, right? They're far more likely to keep and advance their career. And there is the um, research to support that. So there's also an ROI or return on investment for every dollar that is spent working with kids in the area of the career ready skills on a sustained basis, integrating them into lessons with fidelity. So if someone's planning a lesson, they look at their lesson outcome, they lo obviously look at the academic outcomes, and they look at the lesson process, right? And they're thinking about the process. What am I gonna do? How am I gonna teach this? When they look at that process in their Danielson framework, it's very easy, once a skill is identified that kids need, to put an activity in there or just shift an activity that helps kids to have that practice. And that's what PD is recommending, is that it be integrated into lessons. So how did all this come about? In 2015, there was an internal career readiness committee that was formed. They were big business and industry leaders that met with uh, educators and other workforce folks in a committee to study what needed to happen to get our kids ready in Pennsylvania for careers and jobs and, and post-secondary school. So here are the conclusions. Embed the career ready education and workforce development 
in peak, uh, pre-K to 12, which is happening, right? Laura was just here, she was talking about, Laura Friedrich, she was just here, and she was talking about all of the things that are helping um, in schools to get kids ready as far as looking at personal preferences and strengths and identifying skills and identifying jobs that they might be interested in. And then the second one was to strengthen and in expand employability skills. And folks, when I refer to employability skills in this presentation, I'm talking about career-ready skills. So here's what happened. PD went back to a drawing board, formed a committee to uh, craft the career-ready skills, we had a lot of folks look at these skills and give us feedback at the national level, National Governors Association, Harvard University Education Department that was really linked to social emotional learning, and the Collaborative for Academic and Social Emotional Learning. Does anybody know Castle in here? Yeah? They're based in Chicago, and they have uh, been working in this work for probably 25 plus years. They have a lot of research to support the work and continue to do the work. And then at, the, at the, our state level, we had a lot of folks that gave us feedback on the skills. So here they are again. So if you take your, um, your continuum and you look to the left, you're going to see three big buckets. You'll see self-awareness and self-management, establishing and maintaining relationships, and social problem solving. Okay. Yep. Jean, could you talk a little bit about these? Here you go. All right. I'll. Uh, talk a little bit about the committee that we formed after the initial committee um, was developed. We included uh, labor and industry, um, some several people from the Department of Education with different backgrounds, and we also had after school representation, and we also had the pre-K, Octel people involved. Am I missing anyone else? And we sat down and um, we special worked, ed, special, special ed, Okay, and safe schools. So we had a, a wide variety of uh, people who had input in the development of these career ready skills. And um, trust me, it was weeks and weeks of wordsmithing. When we thought we had it finished, we emailed it to all of our contacts. Um, a lot of FCS teachers had input in this because um, our academic standards teach to the interpersonal skills and if you were around education several years ago maybe 10 years ago um, there was an interpersonal skills uh, standards developed by the secretary of ed at that time and then they changed them into career ready skills currently so um, we um, used I forget what um, format we followed we had um, books and books of different just different resources to use to determine what we wanted to have on here and then we had all the different levels we split up into high school level preschool level elementary level to develop what it would look like so that it wouldn't look broken and that we were continuously improving all the way up through uh, kindergarten pre-k through uh, 12th grade and then on to you know post-secondary and your employment skills that you need to have so it was um, it was a very um, well thought out thank goodness to Pam the committee chairperson that it it really was a project and it has and it continues on and we'll go through all the things that we've developed so uh, um, which one is working? That one. This one. Okay. Yes. All right. So the self-awareness and self-management. Um, if you start working at the level of the preschool and elementary level, and you're teaching these self-awareness and self-management, the, the students are going to continue to grow, but they're going to learn at the the early levels of school and how to get along with people and how to. Um, 
know what's theirs, what's someone else's, how to share, and you know, just get along. And that's where we started with pre-K because we have a lot of pre-K course, we have a lot of pre-K classes out there, we have a lot of daycare centers. So it's, it's aligned to uh, the early childhood uh, standards through Octel. Social problem solving skills, an important one um, with getting, a, that's also finding the problem and then being able to collaborate with somebody and being open to um, somebody else's opinion and that your idea is not always the best one or the only one. So just teaching students how to get together and collaborate, you know, and, and I know we do that at the career and tech ed world when we have businesses come in and we're trying to encourage us more where they give you problems that you would see in the um, employer, employer area and then you can come up with some solutions. I think here in State College, if you're going on the State College um, school district, they have that going on at their school. Um, establishing and maintaining relationships. That's, um, you know, building those relationships with your teacher, first of all, with your administrators, with your guidance counselors, with each other, so that you um, know how to get from point A to point B if you are in this scenario that is not happen to, happening to work out well for you. You know how to reach out to the people that can help you. So that's where um, establishing and maintaining relationships is important. And I know we talk about that a lot with teachers. Teachers are supposed to be reaching out and making the students feel um, comfortable in the classroom because I know when I was a teacher the first day of school I handed out a little survey of 10 questions so that the students could tell me a little bit about themselves why they were in my class what they hoped to get out of it what was their favorite music what activities did they do and I made it a point to go home and read them that night and the next day I made it a point in each class to say something and it would shock them they're like you actually read that and I'm like, well, yeah, I didn't ask for no reason at all. I want to know where you're coming from. I actually, it was a funny story. I had a set of twins in my class. One was first and second period, and the, the twin came in ninth period. Honest to God, I, I knew they had the same last name, but whew, I'm bad with names. It took me, uh, I bet you, a month to realize that I said, you had a different hair color this morning. And she, I said, did you go over to the Career and Tech Center and get your hair done? She goes, oh, that's my twin sister. And I'm like, oh, wow, talk about, and I'm a twin. So yeah, I, I was surprised with that. But you know, just trying to get to know who's in your classroom and where they sit. They didn't even, they sit in the same class. So um, skills for each of the domains were broken down, like I said, into each grade level. And we did um, work in those, we had people on the committee that were experienced in middle school, elementary, and high school, and we broke it down and we would look at what the previous grade band would um, identify as being important and we would try and make them grow. So it wasn't repeating the same thing and um, allowing the students to continue on in their learning. And like I said, they were aligned to the Pennsylvania Learning Standards for Early Childhood through the Office of Octel, and I'm just like drawing a blank. It's the Office of Child Development and Early Learning. <laughs> That's uh, a, a partnership between the Department of Health and Human Services and the Department of Education. They're housed in um, the Pennsylvania Department of Education, but they align to their standards as well. Okay, and then, yes, you can be up. Yeah, this is you. So I have a small activity. Um, if you take your continuum of skills, the one that's nicely colored, first thing I would like you to do is uh, just look at that first uh, self, self awareness and, and self management, and that's the yellow one at the top. Follow the first set of rectangles across, okay? So you're gonna see the progression of skills as you work across. So I think the first one is identify emotions, recognize, recognize and identify emotions, Easy. label them, then express a feeling, identify and express a feeling, uh, look at expressions of feelings 
within a context, so whether you're on the bus, you're at a dance, whatever, and then the final one, which are the ones um, that we want our students to be able to graduate with, evaluate behaviors in relation to the impact on self and others. So if you go across, you can see the progression of skills. If uh, you pick a grade level band of students that you're working with, follow it down in a column, and you'll see the self-awareness and self-management, establishing and maintaining relationships and social problem-solving skills of that grade level band. So please locate that. And then what's nice is you can see the relationship to the other grade level bands. And the way these work, they do work like standards. We don't call them standards, we call them a continuum of skills, because Pennsylvania has plenty of standards. Um, and so when you're thinking about these, you need to be thinking about the progression. And the expectation is that these students acquire, be able to know, understand, and do the skill by the end of the grade level band. Okay. So up in front of you is another reason why we felt these were so important, not only in schools but in the workplace. When I went to school, I was asked to do a lot of memorization. I was able in math to um, do a process and come up with an answer, period. <laughs> and if it was right, it was right, and if it wasn't, I had to go back and do it again, okay? Now in math, look at the shift in our schools. We're asking kids to be able to really understand a problem and what's being asked of them when they're thinking about that problem. They're going to be, have to be able to represent that problem symbolically often. They're going to have to use problem solving skills. They're going to have to be able to recognize patterns. They're going to have to be able to synthesize information, pull it from here and here and here. They're going to have to be able to explain their thought process and how they got to an answer or got to a place where they had to stop because they were stuck. Very different from the education that I received. When I was in reading, I had a reader. I had to have nice handwriting. I had a spelling list. I had to look up the words and define them. Sometimes I had to use them in a sentence. Very factual information. Now, we're asking kids to look at things more critically. We're asking them to, to justify their answers. We're asking them to think about um, something that they read and maybe engage in a debate with others around the protagonist. Very different. So I think that has to factor in as well. So we did a lot of aligning in, the, in uh, the work that we did. These skills are aligned to the career education and workforce standards. They're aligned to the business standards. They're aligned to the math, science, and technology practices. They're aligned to Danielson. There al there's a lot of aligning. Um, just about every subject area, library, the arts, all of them. One of the things we did was we aligned to the National Network of Business and Industries Common Employability Skills. The folks that work in that national network are folks like Walmart Corporation and other large and small. I think Amazon is there, okay? And they, they gave us a framework to look at about what employers expect when they're hiring our kids. So that's the front of the paper or the, um, the document. There's the link. And then they identified four broad domains and we aligned to these. Personal skills, people skills, applied knowledge, and workplace skills. Okay? 
So in the personal skills, for instance, there is integrity, there's initiative, there's dependability and reliability. And then behind this page, this is a four page document, are the descriptors of what dependability looks like in the workplace, what integrity looks like in the workplace, what teamwork looks like in the workplace, communication. Why did we do this? Remember that committee in 2015 that I talked about? Um, they told us, we can work with your students in teaching them job skills and teaching them the technical job skills, whether it's McDonald's and how to um, put a hamburger together, for instance, or whether it's um, a public relations job and there are specific steps within that job that are expected. What they cannot teach, and the reason our students cannot hold jobs, is the fact that they do not have these employability skills. This is what sustains a career. And these are the things that our employers in Pennsylvania and across the United States have told us we can't teach. They can say, you need to be on time. You need to dress appropriately. You can't tell a customer to talk to the hand. <laughs> But if, if folks don't, if those students don't pick that up, if those young employers, employees don't pick that up, they're out. Okay, let me see if I can get this. that all of you have heard of the children's book by Judith Force entitled Alexander Hey, are you tired of the media spinning the horrible, truth and pushing no false narratives upon you? And I'm moving to Australia. Well, I've entitled I'm sure that all of you have heard today. of the children's Sorry, book I'm by Judith Force entitled No Good Alexander and the Terrible and probably no good why I did awful get the day. job. And I'm, what I'd like for you to do is just to enjoy and observe what not to do during an interview. Thank you. Hello, Jenna Smith. Hello. Okay. Oh, John. Hurry. Now, who is John? Oh, that's my boyfriend. Oh, okay. he's so slow. Let me tell John uh, quickly down the, to the lounge because I like to do one on one interview. Okay. Okay, John, hi. Um, I like to do one on one interviews. So if you want to go on down to the lounge, so down to the left and stop on and you are wide into it. Thank you. Um, 
now I'm 28. I live with my parents. Um, they're the reason I'm having to get a job. Um, I'm into country music. I like rock music. I love Trace Atkins. I have a boyfriend, John. We met him. We've been going out since Wednesday. He said we're going to get married. That's about okay. it. Why do you think you love to work at our organization, Janice? Um, that you guys had a job opening. Okay. Uh, it sounds like you may not know too much about our organization or about the job opening. Would you like for me to tell you a little bit about the job opening? If you want to, but could you kind of like speed it up because I'm going to be out of here in like 15 minutes. So. Okay. Um, well, the job here is as a receptionist and a bookkeeper. So we take turns once a week, including myself, we clean the front office and we clean the bathroom. We take turns doing that. And then on top of all of that, the skills that you really need to possess are uh, good computer skills, good communication skills, and uh, of course, bookkeeping skills. Do you possess all of those skills? I'm sorry, but you lost me at bathrooms. I don't even clean my own bathrooms at home. I mean, I got a new tattoo and I can't get it wet, so. Um, have you ever been employed before, Jen? Down at licensed department store in their office. And why are you no longer employed there? Well, I'll tell you why. Uh, the boss was a class number one jerk. She was always on my case about being late, and I was never really late. It was like a 10 or 15 minutes, maybe. And it wasn't every day. It was like every other day. She was always also on my case about my door bouncing and my columns coming out right. And I was always off like one or two dollars here one or two dollars there so okay. she was just a witch <laughs> okay how long were you employed there yeah. um, about a week or two okay. and what did you enjoy most about the job um, I really didn't like it much um, the paycheck that was that was good um, would you describe yourself as a team player Janice I don't know. No. I, I played basketball in high school for a little while, but I'm just really not into sports. How would you handle conflict with a co-worker or with your supervisor? I just tell them to talk to the hand or I ignore them. It just kind of depends on how severe the conflict is. I think I'm going to skip the other questions because you seem to be in a real hurry. Do you have any questions for me? When do I start? Well, actually, I have a lot of other applicants to interview, so I have not hired anyone yet. Well, can you tell me what our pay is going to be? Um, well, like I said, I haven't hired anyone yet, but I will be notifying both those who are hired and those who are not by letter within 8 to 10 days. And I think this concludes the interview. Thank you very much for coming. Can you take care of that for me? Thank you. John, I think I got it. <laughs> okay. You get the idea. So I as you know, as uh, humorous as this may seem, I felt very sorry for both of them because um, it was clear that the uh, applicant had no idea about how to appropriately approach an interview. She didn't have the skills. And the, uh, the uh, interviewer kept trying to give her the benefit of the doubt. So it's, it's just uh, one reason that these are so important. Um, so on your continuum, I'm going to take you back one more time to those three big buckets on the left. Below those are those aligned skills that we used the National Network of uh, Business and Industries employability skills to align to. And you'll see them there. There's another way to look at them as they're represented on your um, continuum. So I wanted to spend some time, we have a lot of tools, you're probably like, really? What am I gonna do with all this stuff? How am I gonna do this? this? Our team has spent a great deal of time 
Most of us, I think all of us, have worked in classrooms. We've been teachers. We've worked with students. We understand the demands of the day. We understand the, um, the preciousness of time and planning. So t keeping that all in mind, we developed some tools. The first thing I want to show you is the introductory document. And all of these are available. If you go, if you just do a search that says um, Pennsylvania career ready skills, they're not career readiness skills, they're career ready skills. So if you search, the um, link and the page will come right up for you. the introductory document. Um, this document basically is the research behind the career ready skills. Yeah, it won't let me advance it. So what you'll see is you'll see the research. I'll just keep paging down. Yeah. Okay. And then behind that, some of the practices that already exist in Pennsylvania, like uh, our ESSA indicators, Future Ready PA, Career Education and Work Standards. So if you are trying to explain to someone what these are, this is a good document. There's the continuum, and then there's the alignment. This is um, the Danielson alignment. And you can see just how strong that alignment is between the career ready skills, which are represented on the left, and then those four, um, those four quadrants of the Danielson across the top. So that's one. And then we move into the academic standards and the alignments there. And there are many of them. OK. We've done all of the academic standards. So if you're an administrator and you want to have a professional development, you might want to have each department look at where they're crosswalked and how they can integrate them into their everyday teaching. Yes. Yeah, um, I'm here with the new counselors. I, I supervise the counselor interns for the University. And so, like, we're just talking, like, going back to 2012, you know, you had the interpersonal that we were, like, posted for a while, but it was the 16th set of standards. So we were just, like, wondering, like, you know, why didn't these get a number, like, the way the career standards have a number, are they going to get a number, or is there a whole different, like, rollout than a set of numbers? Yeah, these aren't academic standards. Okay. It has to do with opening up Chapter 4 and making them an academic standard. When you open up Chapter 4, you get a lot of different advocacy people come in and want different things for just their group, for their group, for this group, and that group, yeah. and they, they just have chosen not to do that as an academic standard. And that's standard. what happened, I think. Well, what happened was they were they were posted as a um, an academic standard um, not not under chapter four, but here's here's if you're teaching interpersonal skills, here's some standards to follow. Yeah. And then that's what happened. Those advocacy advocacy groups came in and said you need to take these down. You're teaching morals and right. personal beliefs and yeah, that's we understood why they that, and we were just kind of like you know questioning like and and you know we see them as a very good thing. You know, as counselors, we've known all along that this stuff is important. Right. Now we have something like. You know, concrete to say, yeah, these really are important. But then the question is, is like, how, you know, are they?
they be rolled out to districts? Because like I get a lot of, I get around in a lot of districts, in, you know, in central Pennsylvania. Yeah. And like, you know, some people are totally unaware of them. Right. Some, some are, and it's like also like from the school counselor, because I know there's a lot of school counselors that come here to this conference. Like, what is our role supposed to be? And even though we've been doing this like all along, tier one, tier two, tier three, like where do we fit in? So um, to answer your question, the student interpersonal skill standards are where we started. Okay. These are the hybrid of those. Okay. The reason they aren't numbered is because they are not academic standards. So what will happen is our state board of education will endorse them, but they're not going to vote on them as academic standards. Okay. Um, your role is to raise awareness to use them in your 339s, right? I'm working directly with Mike Thompson um, to use them in your 339s in your planning and to share them out with your teachers. Because until they reach the classroom and teachers start using them, um, then you know they're not going to be effective because these skills are everyday skills. Think about this. Education is a social process. Everything you do with kids is an interaction, whether you stand at the door and you say, hey, how's your day going, or you give them a look, <coughs> nonverbal. When you're, uh, when you're in working in instruction, whether you're doing direct instruction or whether you're doing a collaborative uh, situation, you're communicating with kids. Your communication is social communication as well as academic. These are social skills. They need to be integrated into lessons, not to be taught alone. I don't have anything against evidence-based programs like Second Step or Olvaeus. They're very good programs. What oftentimes happens, though, in schools, um, you know, and I, my background is in curriculum and special education. So what sometimes happens is the lessons are taught the, t the, the money is paid for the program. The teachers, and it's usually a lot of money, the teachers are trained, right? Sometimes the school counselor comes in and teaches the lesson. Sometimes the teacher teaches the lesson. Whoever teaches that lesson, the rest of the school day moves on, and everybody just goes back to the way things were before. So there's no carryover for kids. There's no modeling. There are, might be teachable moments that come in here and there, but kids need to identify these skills and use them regularly and understand that they're a part of their educational process. I'm going to show you right now, absolutely. Um, so what our team did was we did resources for school districts, and those are LEA. So right now we have a pilot going on. We have five schools in the pilot. We have two high schools. We have um, two charter schools. We have a special ed satellite school. I'm missing one. Preschool. And a preschool, thank you. Um, and they are using this toolkit, and they'll be at the SAS Institute to share. So there are pieces for the educator and pieces for the school district. I'm going to show you the ones for the educator. There is a self-assessment. And all school districts have been mailed a poster that's larger than life, three yeah. foot by four foot. Yeah. So every school district has one. I've been giving them out everywhere I go. Right. And we've been promoting it. So it's not that it's not out there, but a school district has to self-assess, see where they are in the process. We've created tools to help you implement it, assess yourselves, and grow from it. So we, we have a bunch of resources on here. We have resource, resources on what um, their videos, what it would look like in the classroom, how would the teacher model it. So there's lots and lots of resources. It's just a matter of going there and learning about it.
So um, what I'd like to show you very quickly, there are, if somebody says to you, oh man, I gotta start planning lessons and you know, there's a great place to start that goes with that teacher self-assessment. And there are 10 practices, four of them are social, six of them are educational, that folks can do right out of the box as they're planning lessons or as they're working with kids. One of them is student-centered discipline. Does this mean that you close the doors and the students take over? No. What this means is that students have input into what's happening in the classroom and some decisions about what's happening with that discipline. So that it's not just, these are my rules. What they end up being is, these are our rules. We are in this together. That makes sense. These are evidence-based. These are from the American Institutes of Research. Um, the next one is student lang or teacher language and how you talk to kids. Giving kids responsibility, holding them responsible, and having them make choices sometimes in the instruction, in their decisions for instruction. So do you want to do activity A or do you want to do activity B? Um, warmth and support. Do kids feel supported? Do some kids feel supported and some kids feel not really welcomed in the classroom? And on the side are videos that show what that looks like. And then there are six instructional practices as well. Cooperative learning, class discussions, self-reflection and self-assessment, balanced instruction, academic press and expectations. Does everybody know what academic press is? And if you don't, that's okay. Academic press is making sure that students are challenged and not frustrated. That's academic press. And your expectations, that you expect everyone to succeed. And that you provide the tools to help with that. And that's where that multi-tiered system of support comes in competence building. So these are things that can happen right now that teachers don't have to plan for. But then, our team went to work, rolled up their <coughs> sleeves, and for each one of the skills, for instance, in self-awareness and self-management, if I go to the high school level and I open this up, what you're going to see is you're going to see the skill You'll see them all. This one is evaluate behaviors in relation to the impact on self and others. And here are all of them for that grade band. But this is the specific one that is being addressed. Below it are performance indicators because our teachers said, what does this look like in a classroom? So we came up, our team came up with performance indicators and they were vetted by teachers and by others. And we took their suggestions and went back to the drawing board and we, and we made some revisions. And then there are adult supportive practices that you can do with kids and then also specific teaching strategies. And so this is where the pilot folks are working in the toolkit. And they will be reporting out at the SAS Institute about how it's going. And then the interesting thing is, it's just like kids. Uh, every one of these pilot schools is in a different entry point. Some of them are already working heavily in social emotional learning. Some of them have <coughs> never done any work in social emotional learning. And so what we're hoping to find is just more information and feedback and more strategies from the teachers. Because every time I go somewhere, someone will say, okay, I'm doing this or I'm doing that. So I wanted to share that because that is really the heart there's only one other piece, and these are in your, um, these are, uh, we'll, this is posted online with all the links, but there's also a great piece for family engagement. Yep. Yeah. In here are also family engagement. No, it didn't. It, it, there's no back. 
presentation. This is her page and here's the link to the page that I'm talking about as well. There's the continuum. The family resources are excellent. Um, I would just like to leave you so that you can get to lunch with couple of things. We have coming out so the kids will be able to be a uh, part of their learning in this area. We have I can statements that were just vetted through the department. And what that will do is those um, portfolios that you folks are working on for the career exploration and decisions in careers. At graduation time, we're, we will have a uh, document that shows what students can do in the area of the career ready skills that they can share with their employers or prospective post-secondary schools. And we will be working in the area of mini badges as we go along to award to kids. So that is being done. And so I guess the questions I have for you is, how will you share this information back with colleagues? Will you be able to share the resources that are available with the Career Ready Skills? Can Career Ready Skills activities <coughs> be used as evidence in a portfolio? Depends on the activity, but sure. Because these two things, thinking about careers, and doing the exploration and decision making, and then working within the employability skills that I've shown you, are not two separate things. They are integrated, and our employers keep telling us that we need these skills, we need these skills, we need these skills. All right, any questions for me? Or for Jean?